Good morning, party people. I am coming to you from the Reykjavik Harbor, which is near my home base in Reykjavik that we've used for the last couple of months. A lot of whale watching tours go out of here, commercial fishing ships. Uh, so it's just a nice, fun place to go and uh, see the sunrise and uh, just hang out. So uh, this morning, let's go tackle some of your questions. Let's see, number one is Medi. The most highest voted question is Medi. It says, hi Brent, what's the first step when SQL Server is overloaded? We can still connect to the SQL Server by SSMS. Okay, so what overloaded means can be different to different people. For me, overloaded means it's no longer responsive, like that you can't even connect to it. But I think you might be, if you're able to connect via SSMS and queries are working, my guess is you just mean it's slow rather than it's overloaded. So I teach you how to do this in my How I Use the First Responder Kit class. The first thing that I'll go and do is run SP Who is Active just to see which other queries are running right now. I do that because SP Who is Active is extremely fast to respond. Second thing that I'll go and do is run SP Blitz first, and I show you what parameters I use with it during the How I Use the First Responder Kit class. I know it sounds kind of funny to have a query called SP Blitz first that isn't the first query that I go and run, but the reason why is SP, uh, SP Who is Active just runs so quickly and tells me if we have the server not responding at all. SP Blitz first takes a five second sample of things like your weight statistics, perfmon counter, plan cache, and during those five seconds it checks all kinds of things. Is a log file growing? Is there a long running query that's blocking others? Are you experiencing any poison weights? Is there a backup running or a check DB running? Checks all kinds of things that you and I just don't have the time to go and check inside of the span of five seconds. And then at the end of those five seconds, it gives you a prioritized list of reasons why we think the SQL Server is slow right now with URLs for each of the warnings. That's the place that I would start. SP Who is Active, then SP Blitz first, and it'll give you a quick rundown of what to look for. And then for more details, attend my How I Use the First Responder Kit class. Next question comes from Alan. Alan says, do you think learning SSIS is still worth it, or should everyone hop onto AWS? I think you might have uh, mixed up a couple of terms here. SSIS and AWS don't really have anything to do with each other. SSIS is a tool that you use to move data. AWS is a cloud provider. What I think you might have meant was, should I learn SSIS or Azure Data Factory? Azure Data Factory is kind of Microsoft's replacement for SSIS. It's not that SSIS is going away, I mean, as far as I know, but Azure Data Factory makes sense if you're in Azure, if your company's decided to move to Azure, because ETL, you know, extract, transform, load type stuff, that load is inherently bursty. It runs in very short bursts. So you need it, uh, a whole bunch of it, but only for a short period of time. Well, it doesn't make sense to pay a lot of licensing for that and have it just sit idle most of the time. That's where things like Azure Data Factory come in, because you just pay for what you use when you use it. Um, if your company's in Azure, I would check out Azure Data Factory. If your company's not in Azure, like if you went to Amazon, and you're looking for building ETL tools, I would look at whatever that cloud provider's native ETL tool is that scales practically infinitely and just charges you for what you use. In AWS's case, that would probably be AWS Glue. There are lots of other ways you could roll your own ETL, though. Next up, uh, Igor says, Hi Brent, in a recent office hours, you had a question about changing the care data type column into Vercare. In your answer, you mentioned that she correctly spotted that the, correct, that the care data type should not be used and that should be avoided in the future development. Why is that? Okay, so a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, people like mainframe developers would use character data types and they were a fixed length no matter how little or large you put in them. 
Today, it's extremely rare to see people doing new development with fixed length strings. It's much more often that they will have variable length strings like names or part numbers that will always change over time. So it doesn't make sense to incur the overhead of a fixed width data type in most cases when the data isn't fixed width. If your data truly is fixed width, then sure, use the care data type. But it's probably not really fixed width. They just think it will be. And then tomorrow, they're going to tell you something different. It's like, man, I've had so many situations where the business has said, oh yeah, I swear on my honor that this column will always be unique. And then, it, of course, what does it turn out? 15 people share the same social security number. I have the burn marks for that one. Next up, 1440 by 1080, ah, very funny, asks, Hi Brent, is there a way to remove a completion time of just a specific query, something like no count, and not use the global settings in SSMS? N not as far as I'm aware. I, I would wonder what it is that you're trying to solve there, why you want to do that. Um, if you're looking to track the completion time of a lot of queries, don't rely on the messages output in SSMS. Try logging things to a table there instead. So then that way you can more easily rapidly compare between multiple passes. If you're doing a lot of diagnostic tuning, I'll often go create a table, not a temp table, because I want to make sure that I can use it across multiple sessions. And I'll log diagnostic info into there. Steve asks, what is the funniest mistake that you've ever seen a developer make that took down the whole database? I was once, this is Steve still talking, I was once writing a stored procedure to delete data from multiple tables and I put in a begin trans and I don't know how, but I took down the database for a few hours for recovery. Instead of saying like what somebody else did, I'm going to tell you the things that I did, like my funniest memories from outages that I caused uh, along the way. One of the first outages that I can ever remember was I was working as a systems administrator, uh, pretty much kind of fresh out of college, and I don't want you to think that that means that I completed college. I did not. I dropped out three times. But shortly after one of the times that I dropped out of college, I was working for a photo studio, and this photo studio did high school graduation photos. Every morning, the photographers would come into the office, and they would get printed out labels of all the, the shoots that they had to do that day and where they had to go, and like stickers that they put on the film canisters. I'm not going to explain what a film canister is. Well, it was my job as a systems administrator to come in first thing in the morning and print those. I did the same thing that all of you have either done eventually in your career before or you're going to do at some point in the future. I ran a query without including the where clause, and I managed to hose all of the students and appointments, not just for that day, but for all of them. So I had to fix that, obviously, so I immediately panicked, and at least because I was the systems administrator, I knew that where the backup tapes were, because I was involved with switching those out. So I, I knew what I'd done that morning since the backup. I just dropped everything uh, that I was doing. I restored everything from scratch. And as the people started filtering into the office, uh, I said, look, I'm going to give it to you straight. I hosed the database, I'm restoring, unfortunately you're going to have to wait around for your labels and, and uh, what you're going to be doing today, because it's going to take a while to restore this stuff from tape, I'm not going to explain what tape is, take a while to restore all this stuff from tape. Now the owner of the company had a legendarily bad temper, he would throw things, he would fire people on the spot for stuff. And so I was kind of rightfully nervous that he was going to freak out, but when he came in and I'm talking to him about this, I said, look, this is entirely my fault. I'm the one who screwed this up. I'll own it, and you can fire me. I would understand, but don't fire me until the restores finish and I print out these labels, because y'all don't know how to do this, and you're probably going to need to find my replacement. I understand if you're going to fire me. It's a fireable offense. I get it. But just wait. Well, of course, he knew that I, I kind of, he was kind of backed into a corner at that point. So, <sighs> goes and leaves. And he never did fire me. He's like, 
later he's like, people were like, why didn't you fire Brent? And he's like, well, that's an example of taking ownership and accountability. And I, I still to this day think that if the restore had already finished when he came in, I think the story probably would have been a little different. So that's one of my favorites. We'll uh, stop with that one. Uh, next up, oh, there's one other one that I really loved. Uh, I was, uh, sooner or later, everybody in their career who works with SQL Server is going to try to use database mail, and you're going to try to use it inappropriately. So I was using it to email our customers uh, about something that they had to go and do. This wasn't at the photo studio. This was much later in my life. Uh, the, I was emailing customers about something, and I had a bug in the code, and it just continuously kept sending emails overnight. We crashed our Exchange server because we filled up the drives with outgoing email, which was kind of good because it limited the blast radius of how many customers got repeated emails. Could have been so much worse if our mail server hadn't run out of drive space. So it's kind of funny because everybody in the office is like, why isn't email working? I'm like, oh, once we started getting to uh, root cause analysis and the exchange admin was able to tell me that there were tens of thousands of outgoing mails from my SQL server. Then I was like, oh, <laughs> he, -he. Mm -hmm. emails don't really belong in SQL server. Next up, Alexi asks, hi, Brent. How, it's funny how everybody says hi, Brent. Alexi says, how hard would it be for Microsoft to rename the master database in SQL Server to something else? Just as they did on GitHub, they renamed the master branch to main. Oh, that's such a good question. So here's the thing. Let's take the SA login. SA is the hard-coded, built-in systems administrator login. It's uh, included when you install SQL Server, assuming that you use SQL authentication. Over the years, there have been a few best practices guides that would tell you to rename the SA account to something else. Because what this would do was it would head off problems of people who were trying to use password guessing scripts. Scripts that would just continuously rotate through passwords in an attempt to log in as SA. Eventually they would crack it and then they would get in and wreak all kinds of havoc. That was the theory. Well. In order to head that off, Microsoft decided to try, or people decided to rename their SA accounts. It was a best practice for a while going around. Some checklists still have that out there. I don't bother doing that. But uh, uh, what do you know? It broke upgrade scripts. SQL Server shipped, or Microsoft shipped several versions or, or cumulative updates and patches to SQL Server that would break um, if the SA account was renamed to something else. And that's just a login, let alone a database name. You change the name of something like master and there are going to be all kinds of effects going through not just SQL Server, but community tools out there, third-party applications. There are so many things that expect a database name to master. Okay, now having said that, if you go under the hood in Azure SQL DB managed instances and in SQL Server 2019, there are hints that Microsoft is working on replicating the master database to other places. And as part of that work, they have columns in there in Sys databases that talk about another database name. Because if you replicate a master database to several other SQL servers, well, you can't do that because they can't share, they can't have their database over, their master database overwritten in flight, so it's named under different names. It is theoretically possible that at the same time that Microsoft is working on copying the system databases, they might also be working on a way to rename the system databases. But even if they do, I would still worry about any kind of third-party application or script, and the, the ramifications would be so big out there. I understand why folks want to do it, and it's the same reason that I renamed um, our GitHub uh, repo in the first responder kit. We renamed our master branch over to main, I believe it was. Uh, so I understand why they want it. It's just incredibly difficult for SQL Server. Uh, next up, Uncompressed DBA says, Hi, Brent. If I use compression for some tables where the keys are ever increasing, does that increase the odds to encounter page latch weights? Not page IO latch, but page latch weights. 
So before you go in uh, and uh, think about that, the thing that I always ask is what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Generally speaking, high insert tables don't feel like good candidates for compression to me. It's possible that yours might be. I would just want to know a lot more about the problem that you're trying to solve. Now, could you run into problems with page latch weights due to high insert rates? Yes, whether you have compression or not. But generally, I think about that in like the one to 10,000 inserts per second sustained range. If you're doing one to 10,000 inserts per second sustained for hours at a time, that's where I start to worry about things like latch weights. But if you're talking about an insert per second or 100 inserts per second, it's just not that big of a deal on modern hardware, even laptop grade hardware. It's just really not that big of a deal. Next highest voted question, a guy named Jim asks, Hi Brent, do you feel that the option with encryption is the best remedy in an enterprise software context where leadership argues against stored procedures and functions because it means that our code is on the customer servers? He says, that's what we did before, before the incident, I guess, and it was painful from a support perspective. Anytime somebody wants to use the with encryption option, what I do is I go download, I have them watch my screen, and I go download. There's a, a tool out there called SQL Decryptor, and you can download a totally free test version. You download it, and it decrypts all of the code in seconds. For those of you who prefer PowerShell, I want to say DBA Tools has a commandlet that also decrypts uh, encrypted stored procedures and functions doesn't require knowing the password, that the with encryption stuff is wildly insecure. So if your goal is to hide the code from customers, it's simply not going to work. And I've used that knowledge to my advantage when a software vendor has said, well, sure, our code is slow, but you're not allowed to see it. And I'm like, oh yeah, watch this. I've restored the database to another server, pointed SQL Decryptor at it, immediately showed them their code, and said, here's the deal. It's your call. If you want to keep encryption on, I'm going to keep pulling your pants down in front of your client and showing them the code. Or, if you'd like to work together instead of against each other, go decrypt all these things so that monitoring tools will work at your customer and you'll know what's slow. And that shock and surprise of how easy it is to decrypt this stuff has won them over every single time. They're like, oh, you must be some kind of leet hacker. No, I know how to use Google, which apparently they do not. Next up, let's see here. Torben asks, schema lock, select star into new table from old table. Will that lock the schema while the select is running? If the, okay, so uh, anytime that you have a question like that, like will this lock something, try it. Just do a begin tran and go see. Go create a fake table where you're going to do your work. Don't do this in production, obviously, but create a fake table with millions of rows in it and go see. Don't go to the internet and post your question in the vain hope that some stranger is going to take time out of their day to teach you something that you could figure out with a 10 second experiment. Go get up off your lazy rear and run the experiment. Doesn't take that long. Come on now. Uh, let's see here. Now, now I got to go back. My thumb accidentally scrolled. So let's see here. Asian DBA says, that, that's the name that they used. Asian DBA says, love your work, Brent. Thank you. When would you choose read scale clusterless always on over traditional always on availability groups? So I wouldn't um, if your goal is to have lots of readable replicas for reporting. The problem with always on availability groups is it's enterprise edition only. So it ends up getting really, really expensive for every replica that you query. 
In that case, I would use regular plain old availability groups just because if I'm going to have that many SQL servers up and running, I am going to try to have the ability to use some of them for failover at some point when all hell breaks loose. The uh, other thing that I would think about in there is that if you need to scale out to that many servers for reporting purposes, you should probably check out replication too, or log shipping, one of the other solutions. Things that work with standard edition and can scale out to more replicas with less overhead. Whereas always on availability groups, always adds uh, overhead on the primary. Next, or to put it another way, I don't know anybody who has chosen read only, read scale avail, always on availability groups. I'm sure there's like a dinosaur, I say a dinosaur, you know, like Loch Ness Monster out there somewhere in the harbor that's using it. I've just never seen it personally. Uh, Zach says, I have a follow-up to my Vercare Max and Vercare 2500 question. As an aside, the max usage in that one column is only a thousand characters. Is there a performance impact for including a Vercare Max as an included column in a covering index? I'm basically trying to optimize for reports. Okay, here's the thing. The overhead is only based on the size of the data. If you define a big old hunk in column and you don't put much data into it, it doesn't have that much overhead. Now, there are special rules around what you can do with the Vercare Max and Envercare Max column, things that change the way that they're handled as keys. But since you said you're only doing it as includes, I don't know what you're trying to optimize there. It's not going to help you at all in any way, shape, or form. To prove it to yourself, go create another copy of the table with the design that you want, like changing the size from Vercare Max to Vercare 2500 or 1000 and run your reporting queries back to back with set statistics IO on, measure the differences, you will be sadly disappointed. Doesn't that suck? Uh, next up, Zach, oh, Zach again. Zach asks, is there a file size for a data file, like an MDF file, where you would consider adding more data files? If so, how's, what's the best way to approach such a, tax, or a task, and what's the benefit of doing so? Is an 18 gigabyte MDF file a bad thing? 18 gigabyte. Zach, my phone handles more data than that. 18 gigabytes. If someone gave you a 32 gigabyte USB drive, you'd probably be like golf clap, but I can buy one of those for $10. 18 gigabytes is not big data. Add a terabyte of data I might start to look at those kinds of things. The reason why you might want multiple data files is if you want to separate the data files across different storage devices or across different storage adapters. If you're running under things like VMware, if you're running under Amazon EC2 where you can put different data files on different EBS volumes. But generally speaking, those kinds of benefits start to kick in at around a terabyte is where that starts to make more sense. Now, now let, me, let me rephrase that. Somebody out there in the audience is going to be like, well, I have this 18 gigabyte data file and it actually makes a big difference if I put it on four, four gigabyte data files because uh, I get more throughput from VMware. That's because you're not caching jack. If you're caching anything, then it's not going to have that kind of a benefit. And when you're only talking about 18 gigs worth of data, you could cache that here. That's a waterfall in, uh, it's kind of like a Garden of Eden area over in Iceland. It's absolutely gorgeous, really pretty. And then the last one that we'll take is from still a Clarion programmer. Wow, I used to program in Clarion too. It says, I'm a slob and I'm never consistent with indenting, column stacked, or on one line, capitalizations of keywords, etc. Do you ever use a code prettifier, and if so, which one? Or should I just try to develop some self-discipline in my old age? So the only reason that I don't use a code prettifier is that I'm constantly jumping from client to client and from machine to machine. So I have to deal with their coding standards and with whatever prettifier they have installed. So when I'm writing stuff, I'll just generally give it to the client and be like, all right, now you go put it in whatever code style that you like works best for you. 
Um, if I was going to be a full-time employee at the same company working on the same code base for long periods of time, I would just use whatever code prettifier everybody else uses. I'm just not into the religious war of uh, what things should look like. However, if you don't capitalize your select in select statements, you're dead to me. That's about all I have to say about that. It's just a hard, you know, it's a rule that I'm never able to break. I still always type select in uppercase. All right, well, there it goes. Doesn't look like we're going to get much more of the sunrise here today. We got some rain clouds moving in here. Oh, it's just a beautiful windless morning, though, here in the harbor. Absolutely pretty. Uh, so today I'm teaching my mastering parameter sniffing class. So I got to go back home and uh, get some breakfast. And then it's real weird how my time uh, schedule works here. My U.S. time zone classes, for me locally in Reykjavik, that's 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. So the way that I work, I just, I'm always getting up at 3 a.m. I can't, 3, 4 a.m. I can't seem to break that habit. Uh, so I got up at like 3, 4 a.m. this morning. I uh, uh, had uh, uh, oatmeal. <laughs> we uh, had oatmeal. And uh, now I'm going to go probably go off and get just a little something. And then I'm going to go to bed, as crazy as that is. It's like 7.30 a.m. Go take a short nap. And then that way I'll be able to have lunch and uh, teach from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Whoa, really screws with your sleep schedule, especially now that the days are getting shorter here in Iceland. The uh, t sunset and sunrise, of course, you know, we get like, we, Iceland gets like 24 hour sunlight during the summer and almost 24 hour night during the winter, especially as you go north uh, in Iceland up towards the Arctic Circle. Let's see what today's sunrise and sunset. Mm. So today's sunrise was at 6 13 a.m. and sunset is at 8 46 p.m. But it's amazing how they change. Every day, the sunset gets like five minutes earlier every single day. So it's, you really see the changes. We uh, fly back to uh, California, move back to San Diego in about a month from today. Uh, so it'll be perfect timing, right? As the days are getting short and gloomy here in Iceland, I'll be uh, heading back to California and getting my bright sunny days again and seeing my Porsche and my Jaguar. I just can't wait. So I will see y'all again at another Office Hours. Adios, everybody.